I'm Jackie Pfeffer Merrill, Director of the Bipartisan Policy Center Campus Free Expression Project. I'm delighted to welcome you all today to our conversation, Pandemic Pedagogy, Remote Teaching and Open Exchange, the first of our two-part webinar series, Campus Free Expression During COVID-19. The Bipartisan Policy Center is a Washington DC think tank that brings together both parties to find the best ideas to support ID opportunities and, and security for American families. And BPC's Campus Free Expression Project promotes po campus policies and programs that foster a safe and welcoming environment for robust intellectual exchange. Camp colleges and universities have a special role in our democracy in preparing the next generation for citizenship and leadership, introducing them to a broad range of issues, and educating them about the values of respectful disagreement and principled exchange. I'd like briefly to introduce our four distinguished panelists. First, Samantha Hedges, she's completing her doctorate in education, leadership and policy studies at Indiana University and is co-moderator of Heterodox Academy's K-12 education community. Al Montero is Frank B. Kellogg, professor of political science and associate dean of Carleton College. Libby Roderick is a director of the Difficult Dialogue uh, Initiative at University of, of Alaska Anchorage and Vice Chair of the National Difficult Dialogues Resource Center. We have to say a special thank you to her for being up so early Alaska time. And Charlie Thomas is Professor of Philosophy and Co-Director of the McDonald Center for America's Founding Principles at Mercer University. This spring, she was honored with the Joe and Jean Hendricks Excellence in Teaching Award. And just a note for our audience about our runner show, we're gonna have a conversation about for about 40 minutes for strategies for encouraging conversations about contentious issues in remote classrooms and hoping to leave uh, our audience of faculty members and administrators some actionable strategies that they can take back as they plan for this upcoming very difficult fall. And we'll also have 20 minutes for audience Q&A and you can send in your questions at any time by Twitter using the hashtag BPC Live or in a chat function on YouTube and Facebook. So now to our topic. The move to online instruction this spring was a trial by fire for many professors. And one of the most important challenges was maintaining a culture of open exchange in the remote classrooms. Students who melt, might have felt confident trying out a difficult or controversial claim in the ephemeral setting of an in-person classroom were more cautious when a, a comment could be screenshotted or recorded. And faculty had to find new ways to establish a community of trust that's so important for creating an atmosphere for frank uh, discussion of difficult questions. According to the Chronicle of Edu Higher Education's tracker of college plans, about one third of colleges are planning for a hybrid model that will blend remote and in-person instruction, about a third are replanning remote instruction only, and about half are planning to reconvene in person, but even reconvening in person, many instructional components will be remote. With deliberate approaches, faculty can do much to create communities of trust and lively debate in their remote classrooms. And I want to start by hearing about uh, what our faculty panelists have to say about these topics. And, and Al, I'm going to start with you. When classrooms went remote at, at Carleton in the spring, you know, what was it like and what are your apprehensions for the fall? Well, for us, uh, as a small liberal arts college with 2050 students, our, our value proposition is the, the residential piece of it that's central to the pedagogy of all of our faculty and all of our courses. So uh, immediately uh, the, the reaction was shock and just daily uncertainty, um, but credit to the faculty and to our wonderful learning and teaching center uh, for guiding us to a remote spring term. Um, but we still felt throughout the term that <clears throat> like a like a chef that was told to cook without a kitchen, uh, we had to make do with the, with the resources that, that we had, and they're considerable resources. But we were, we were building a plane as we were flying it, both at the level of uh, administration where I'm working in academic planning for the whole college to the level of the department and individual uh, faculty. We all had to make great adjustments. Now, the summer has been a bit different because we've had the luxury of time, although not a whole lot of time, to plan for the fall uh, trimester. We're one of those institutions um, that will be a hybrid uh, model using some in-person instruction with mostly online uh, courses in the curriculum, at least for the fall. 
Um, so we've had some time to uh, speak with epidemiologists at the state of Minnesota, uh, with other experts, uh, tap the expertise of our own faculty uh, to figure out how do we do this? How, how do we do something we've never really done before by placing public health concerns first, right, safety first, uh, and then trying to figure out how we can still enable our faculty to do the, the considerable work that they do um, in, this, in this new setting. It's been, uh, it's an understatement to say that it's been quite a challenge, but we're still, uh, we're still planning. We're still dealing with a lot of this uncertainty. When we had a chance to speak earlier, one of the things that you said was especially important that you're encouraging faculty, you started doing the spring and are really looking ahead to the fall, is class social contracts that uh, kind of help establish the environment that, that you want for Carleton classrooms. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, you know, I would say that a, a big part of the pedagogy of a Carleton classroom is, and I believe this is true for so many of our peer institutions, is communication. The ability of faculty, professors, instructors to communicate with their, with their students. And while we're thankful to have uh, a high-tech alternative to the in-person classroom so that we can do some measure of what we were doing before, uh, something is lost. In that, in that communication. Something is lost, uh, body language, uh, the personal contact, um, the, the sort of tacit ways that human beings communicate. Um, so with, with that considerable challenge, we, we had to think about how we construct social contracts. We really did this on a course by course uh, level with every faculty member thinking about the sorts of rules of the road at the very beginning of the term. Some of them spelled them out explicitly in their syllabi about how information in the course would be used online outside the course. Um, there were limitations to what could be done on social media, for example. Um, in other cases, faculty relied on our larger community standards for the entire college, uh, and those were communicated and reinforced. Um, and and Carleton students, I, I think, deserve a great deal of credit. They adapt uh, very, very quickly. Uh, that's not to say that they weren't challenged, but they adapt very quickly to these significant circumstances. So I think in many ways in the spring, we were, we were fortunate to call upon the residual social capital that we have at Carleton and this cultural understanding of tolerance and patience uh, with the views of others. I want to bring Libby in here. Um, so the Difficult uh, Dialogues Initiative, you know, one of the things that you've also written about is establishing mm -hmm. code to conduct or, or ground rules. and. For this pandemic situation, what are you especially emphasizing as, as important and how, how do faculty members do that with their students? Um, well, we also, as was mentioned, you know, went through the very quick and extraordinarily challenging pivot to sh move everybody into remote um, teaching and we will be doing that in the fall. In our case, we have a profoundly working class state with a profoundly working class campus. Uh, we are in the middle of the, uh, the eye of the storm of the climate crisis. And we, if you've been following the Chronicle of Higher Education at all, as a public institution up here, we have been the target of massive budget cuts under a governor that has declared that he does not support um, most public infrastructure. So we were already in a high stress environment uh, and a lot of crisis uh, prior to COVID. Um, and so my greatest concern in the fall really is the, as in many cases, the mental and physical um, health and well-being of students, and but particularly financial. And in our case, if our students do not come back to our campus uh, or the University of Alaska, most of them won't go to college at all. Um, and we have a large indigenous population here. So um, in terms of working with faculty about how to engage in difficult dialogues in this context, we have to be incredibly mindful of the stresses on our students. Um, and that's always true, but even more so now where people are in households where they have multiple people at the same time and they're all competing maybe for the use of the computer or they have to do childcare, they have to do elder care, they have somebody sick in the home and so on. And so what I so I teach faculty across the U.S. and beyond in terms of a wide range of strategies for how to engage difficult dialogues in classrooms. 
Um, and when I do anything from a one hour thing to a week long thing, one of the most important things that I teach as a strategy is this idea that's been mentioned and it's pretty widely used. I think that we need to establish guidelines for discussion, whether you're talking about a, an entire course, which I'm really thrilled to hear if, if entire campus is establishing this, uh, a course, a module, a discussion, whatever it is, before we engage with one another, we really do need to set up agreements for how we're going to engage. And um, I promote the idea that it's wonderful, if possible, to co-create them with your students. If you only have five minutes to do it, uh, you, you do want to bring in your own ideas as a faculty member and say, here's how we're going to do things, which is fabulous. But if you have a little more time, and sometimes people take a class to do this, sometimes people take the entire semester, if it happens to be something where you can use it as an assignment for norm building or talking about ethics or what have you, to co-create with students. And we have a process for doing that. We have a free book we can offer you if you're interested in this particular one. But you're essentially asking students to brainstorm things that they've seen that really help discussions go well and things that they've seen in their experience that help them not go well. Um, and you you create a, a code of conduct, so to speak, together. And one of the things that, I mean, one of the reasons we encourage you to do it with your students is because they then become invested in it. They become monitors of it. You don't have to become the police person in um, you know how folk, things are going. You can encourage them to think about what do we do if people don't go along with the code, you know, with the agreements that we've established, what kinds of norms should we have for that so that it doesn't take anybody by surprise. And it also really lets you tailor the ways you engage with one another to the specifics of the culture of that class or that campus. For example, uh, I live in Alaska, born and raised. We have seven major indigenous nations in Alaska. And so when we are engaging in a classroom and there are indigenous folks involved, they may have very different uh, requests, needs, um, understandings of what kind of communication is civil. I want to bring uh, Samantha in here. Samantha, I know that uh, you uh, have assigned a, a pre-read about, uh, about political conversations. You teach about the politics of uh, K to 16 higher ed, which is a very fraught topic. And, uh, you know, Tell us about bringing in a, a pre-read. I think you've used uh, Polymore and uh, 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 diff the political classroom uh, to set up, helps, help students have something to respond to in thinking about the class. Sure. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you for having me on. Um, I taught a class called the uh, Politics of Education, and it was focused on K through 16. Um, and one of their assignments that they have throughout the class. So they had three times that they had to meet with their group to discuss um, some questions that I set out for them related to the readings they had done, videos they had watched, podcasts they had listened to. Um, I was not a part of these conversations, so I didn't get on when they were having the discussions. They had to schedule them themselves. Um, so I wanted to set the tone for kind of what was expected out of these types of conversations um, as far as, you know, ground rules, things like that. And so I had them read as their first reading for class, uh, the first chapter of the political classroom by Diana Hess and Paula McAvoy. So the goal of that reading was for them to, first of all, think about if they had ever had this experience in their life and they were, um, asked that in a discussion prompt in response to this reading that they were to do. So they had to think about if they had ever been involved um, or taken a class in college or K through 12 that had them deliberate ideas or discuss ideas. So then they would write that discussion prompt, I would respond, and it was a part of the lecture as well um, to discuss this chapter. So it was really just to get them in the frame of mind that these group discussions were to be um, deliberations of ideas. Now in deliberation, you usually come to a conclusion. So they had to answer questions. So they were coming um, to a consensus on response to these questions, but also just this idea of discussion that you could have back and forth ideas that you could bring in your own personal experiences, um, as well as specifically relate to the readings um, that were assigned for that week. Um, and that I really stress that it was about politics, not politicians. So that was a big part of it. 
thanks for that. Uh, and, and Charlie, I want to come to you. So you're a, a liberal arts professor that uh, perhaps pretty unusually had experience teaching on online before uh, the pandemic. And one of the things that you've talked about uh, to me is having accountability exercises to make sure that the students engage with the essential questions of the course. So you, what is an accountability exercise and how do you build it into the class? Thanks, Jackie. And uh, thanks to the Bipartisan Policy Center for setting this up. I've already learned things from my colleagues. So this is a, this is a great conversation. Um, so look, you know, if we were to walk into a face-to-face -face classroom that uh, many people uh, watching this are very familiar with, and we just said, um, you guys talk. You read, right? You're smart. You're committed students. Uh, you're here to do the work. So y'all just talk about it. Um, we know it wouldn't go very well, even if um, even if they had done the reading and even if they wanted to have a good discussion. Um, we just we know that we have to set up um, discussions in class, both by setting up the syllabus to set up expectations for discussions and by modeling, um, you know, good discussion behavior and setting up incentive structures within the context of the class. That has to happen for online discussions, too. If we just create a discussion board or say we're going to have a live discussion on Zoom, but then we just sort of open it up and say, you guys go at it. Um, we can't expect it to go well. Uh, it, we wouldn't expect that face to face and um, going into a virtual environment doesn't doesn't change that. So um, so we have to think about that. Um, so what I've done as a one accountability exercise is um, I've, I've given real teeth to the um, discussion um, uh, board requirement for the class. I've also linked it to other assignments in the class and I think this is a powerful tool to, to link assignments to each other so there's a the, there's a scaffolding effect that happens um, and that's both good for the students developing um, comfort with topics and with processes but it's also good um, for uh, being able to have more sophisticated conversations that is if you set up a discussion board, and as I do say, you must do one original post, that is your idea, your question, your comment, plus you have to respond to two other students, um, but that this is going to be a primary way that you process information with your peers, so you should understand those to be minimums um, and, and continue to use the uh, the discussion board as to whatever extent it's useful. Um, that sets up expectations and sets up boundaries. But then if you are going to yep. do a live conversation, you can go and, and mine the material from the discussion board and say things like, well, Sally, I see that you were interested in X and could you talk about that a little bit more? Um, and so it both makes the discussion board more meaningful and it seeds the discussions that you can have live with your students. That sort of thing. There are lots of other examples. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that uh, helps spring from the discussion board to the classroom as as a integrated community. Um, Al, I want to come back to to you, to just thinking about this the special place that a classroom is. So you know, a classroom isn't is not usually it's not completely closed, and that people will talk about what goes on in, in a classroom outside of class. But you know, normally, uh, you know the professor starts class, the door is closed, and there's a, a closed community that creates trust. And you, you started talking about that a little bit, but I like just to hear a little bit more about, uh, maybe others will chime in too, how, how do you create that sense of trust, especially when people may be in settings that are, are not as conducive to that closed classroom feeling? Yeah, I, I think it's most challenging when you're focused on issues that um, ask students to reflect on their own experiences and bring in their own sort of personal views. That's, uh, we're teaching Generation Z these days uh, at many of our institutions and uh, having children from that generation, I can say that symbolic politics, uh, changing names, bringing down statues, a lot of these things matter uh -huh. tremendously. Uh, but I teach public policy, I teach political science, uh, value-free social science, so how, how do I bridge how do I bring students that are thinking uh, in, in these identity and personal terms um, into a, an arena in which they're talking about very difficult subjects um, that, that, that might um, create some fear that they're going to be judged uh, by their peers? And so a couple of, couple of techniques I can share with you 
I focus on trying to displace their identity a little bit by giving them an excuse to be somebody else. So in two-on-two two or four-on-four four debates, I create advocacy positions, and I, I give those advocacy positions to uh, different groups of students, and I say, here, prepare for the debate, which may, may be preparation that is done outside of class and overnight, and then they come into class, and we only judge the arguments in the debate based on the value of those arguments. We never assume that those positions are in some way reflective of the personal views of the people who are engaging in the debate. Over time, what's being taught is the norm of tolerance for dealing with other arguments that you disagree with by focusing on the premises of those arguments rather than the people that are making those arguments. A more direct way of doing this would be in a simulation in which we hand a dossier, an identity that is not the identity of the student to the student, and have that student play out that identity in a, say, game theoretic, strategic interactive game of, say, democratic transition and comparative perspective or negotiating the tension between public health policy and individual policy, uh, individual uh, liberty, uh, and then sort of work on a piece of legislation or have a simul simulated constitutional convention in which a lot of these uh, eternally important tensions are, are and they, the students have to deal with them, but they're holding positions and identities that are not necessarily positions that they agree with. Um, and then finally, I sometimes invoke my, you know, my own sort of position as the instructor to channel a voice, different arguments that they might not listen to that otherwise. And I'll say for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to take the position of an owner of a coal mine in West Virginia, and we're going to talk about environmental policy. And I want you to ask questions. No ad hominem attacks. Uh, you need to deal with the premise of my argument. And the goal here is to build a bridge to my position and get me to to maybe nudge me a little bit on my position so that I can see the value of what yeah. you're saying. Uh, those are let's frustrating, a, but I think we've got exercises. Let's bring Samantha in. Uh, can you, wh what about building uh, trust, Samantha? Uh, what are your strategies? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I did group discussions. Now, I taught this online class um, pre-COVID-19. I taught it for four semesters, so just as a a side note, um, so they were able to go on campus and get access to technology if they needed. But they their group discussions were via Zoom. They had to have audio and uh, visual with the people they were in the group with. So I kept my students in the same group for the entire, for the duration of the course. Now, you know, it would be nice for them to get to know other people in the class, but I felt that this was really important to build trust because they were talking about, you know, topics of political nature. Um, now everyone had gone to school, so they all had their own perspectives that they could kind of share and learn from each other. And I would notice that over time, those group discussions, people spoke more freely, you know, towards the end of the class than they did at the beginning. I think that was attributed to um, having them stay with the same group the whole time. Yeah. I think in terms of, of building the getting to know one another in this community of trust, uh, Libby, one of the things that I know the Difficult Dialogues uh, Initiative recommends is a, is a circle of object exercise. Mm -hmm. Can you just you know, tell us about how that, what it is and how it builds trust? Sure. It's so interesting listening to this because there's so much to say, I barely know where to start. Um, so in terms of building trust, I mean, I think everybody knows online learning or remote learning is more challenging no matter what, whether you're in COVID or, or in regular times. And so all the things we usually would do, which is to have students share profiles about themselves and uh, do icebreaker kinds of things so they get to know each other and so forth. Um, I, let me just back up and say there is a free resource. I really want to make it available to anybody online and we can find a way to send out the, um, the link on a chat called Start Talking, a Handbook for Engaging Difficult Dialogues in Higher Education. We put it out as part of our initiative about 12 years ago. And it, it contains just a, a, a boatload of um, strategies for all these kinds of things, one of which is the circle of objects. I'll speak to that. Some of which are about trust building and many of which build on what Al was saying, which is there are such a wide range of strategies that are fun for students, that are interesting and engaging for students, that are active, that can be transferred into an online context 
that allow students to articulate their viewpoints on a particular topic um, without revealing their own personal biases or struggles or what have you. He's mentioned a couple of them. There are a whole lot more. Um, so we can go into that in the questions if people want to. But in terms of the circle of objects, it's a very basic exercise. Again, many people may have done it um, in different ways before. The way we teach it has to do with inviting students to bring in an object that is meaningful to them in terms of their cultural or class background. You can adapt it as you need to. Um, and just simply speak for two or three minutes and it's timed and it's the same amount of time for every person. Um, to share what is significant about that uh, to them. I work with faculty, as I mentioned, um, and I have never done this exercise with faculty where somebody doesn't burst into tears um, because what it does is it really allows people to bring in their multidimensionality into a learning environment. And as everybody knows, I think um, it's important to identify one's positionality when we speak in these things. It matters whether or not you are Latinx, it matters whether or not you are first generation, it matters whether or not you are indigenous or whether you are male or whatever your, you know, your background is. And when people bring these things in, uh, people really begin to get a picture of what deeply matters to them and where they're coming from. So that by the time you then engage in a topic on healthcare equity issues or gun control or sexual violence or immigration or the climate crisis, you have a much deeper empathy for where they are speaking from. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on something that Al mentioned a few minutes ago. You know, we're, we're teaching at in many schools uh, uh, Generation Z students and uh, who are, are different in some ways from, from a past generation. Uh, the Pew uh, Research Center uh, says that uh, more people are growing up in, in think-alike communities where demographic and politics are more alike. So people grow up uh, knowing few people whose partisanship, whose news sources, whose political and social views, whose socioeconomic background is, is different from their own. And so when freshmen come to campus, they've got a couple different challenges. They're, they're meeting for the first time more people who are maybe different from themselves. And also uh, they're coming into a, a collegiate classroom environment that's much less structured uh, in most cases than a, than a high school classroom. So it's just their, their, the level of conversation and challenges in conversation goes up. And I, I just would like to really ask about our matriculating first year students and what can we do for them especially to set them up for um, success in this uh, difficult uh, moment when they're, they're not coming on to what's a normal first year semester. Charlie, maybe I'll start with you. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about this a lot. Um, you know, a lot of people, including myself, have been more or less isolated for several months now. Um, Mercer's going back to face-to-face -face learning. Um, we have a mandate that uh, we, students, uh, we need to design classes so that students can keep up if they're quarantined, not, not just catch up, but keep up, which means all of our courses have to be somewhat hybridized, um, but we have to, we're, we're, all, we're doing face-to-face -face primarily. Um, and there is so much anxiety and stress um, around that. And I think these issues that you're talking about of you know, Gen Z are, are definitely gonna come out. I think uh, a lot of, my, I have a 17 year old son, I talked to him about this, his friends and talked to some of my students and they're anxious to come back, most of them. Mm -hmm. um, but their, their families are worried for them. I know a lot of faculty members are worried. And so I, I think we're gonna see a lot of rawness. I already to frankly see it from some of my colleagues as we talk about getting back into the school year and negotiate things that are really um, not usually charged uh, that um, that people are raw and anxious and um, and so I do think that um, in the classroom that's going to play out in conversations I mean if people are raw they're more impulsive and if people are more impulsive sometimes um, the 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 way that dialogue emerges can be a, a little bit more um, difficult so I think for me it's actually more important than ever to to have good structures in place um, to make sure that I'm on top of these things, that if I do online discussions, that I'm monitoring them all the time, that I'm making sure that students introduce themselves. I love these things that Libby's talking about, make sure that, mm -hmm. that, um, that we are human to each other so that these conversations mm -hmm. take place in that context and people are uh, less, um, 
willing to uh, objectify positions and more attuned to the human beings that they're facing, whether it's in class or online. So there, there are a lot of things we could do, but I, am, I'm, I think this is a really um, important thing for us to build into our syllabi, to go in yeah. with this understanding that, that we're going to be dealing with heightened stress, heightened anxiety, um, and perhaps more difficult dialogues because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to remind our audience uh, that in just about 10 minutes, we'll be moving to questions and you can uh, send them in by uh, tweeting with hashtag, hashtag BPC Live or on the, the YouTube or Facebook uh, chat function. And I, I want to keep up this conversation of, of really more difficult dialogue. So we're, we're looking ahead uh, to the 2020 election season, you know, for Generation Z voters, many of them will be, be first time voters. And, and we, one of the things that we do at BPC is to bring liberals and conservatives, Republicans and Democrats together to find pragmatic compromises, um, even in spite of principal disagreements. And so I, I want to think about bringing liberals and conservatives uh, together in, in college classrooms. Uh, someone would like to, to have an idea about how you bring liberals and conservatives together to talk about things at a, at a, in an election semester? Well, can I just say a shout out to a group uh, of younger people, uh, I mean, a group of students who contacted me on the basis of the fact that they'd see this flyer for, for your <laughs> event here today. I believe it's called Bridge USA. Maybe you all know about oh, it. Oh, they it are. We have fun. worked with them. Yeah, and quite wonderful. And they're working uh -huh. on bringing liberals and, and conservatives together in a student from a student driven context, which I really support. I think that's a fantastic model. There's one at the University of Michigan as well called We Listen that is student driven, um, where they make agreements beforehand, where they agree on the facts beforehand and so forth. And so I think reaching to some of these student um, organizations that is, is are intending to do exactly that uh, for their own generation um, is uh -huh. really interesting. Direction. I think it's really important to give students that chance to create the buzz around the election, whether it's uh, uh, debate uh, listening parties or watching parties uh, or uh, other kind. And Bridge USA it have wonderful leadership. Their CEO, Manuel Mills, spoke at our Constitution Day event uh, at BBC last year, and his that uh, link to that event is available on our website. I, I saw someone I, else. I'd like to. Yeah. Could I jump Charlie. in on this really quickly? And, and I, and I yeah. see that we have a, a question that's come in from someone who's watching too about, and I think it's related to the question you just asked, and, and that is about how to respond to a student who refuses to engage because they think um, something is fundamentally dangerous or harmful. Um, and, and this, I think, is related um, to this question about how you foster um, bipartisan or you know, partisan debates uh, when you have students coming in self-identifying um, with one of those ideologies or, or political affiliations. Um, and I just have two two thoughts on this. I'm sure my colleagues in this discussion have, have many more, but um, one is, uh, is, is that the more content driven those conversations are, um, the more that you can begin to push through some of the the surface rhetoric, um, the partisan rhetoric on the surface. So I would say that um, returning, you know, requiring research on, on on things. When a student says, "I I won't engage this because I'm afraid it's it's harmful," to really whether it's in private, probably in private, but say you really want some more information about why that's your position and where your information is coming from, and if possible, to move it into the classroom. And then the second idea, it's, it's very simple, and that is to keep moving. You know, if a student digs in on, on one particular issue, obviously you need to play that out in class and make sure that, that you're not running away from controversy. So we want to do the opposite of that. But also, I think having several different topics and, and moving ahead so that you're looking at things from different angles gives students a chance to get out of any corners that they might have painted themselves into. And a lot of the time, students would like to get out of that corner if you, um, if you give them a chance. And so finding ways to, to change the subject to related topics so that the important stuff is still on the table, but they're not quite um, as pinned down, I think could be very, very helpful. Yeah. Alan, I, I want to come to you about another topic that's going to be important this fall, the, the George Floyd murder um, 
Carlton is only 40 miles from 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 Minneapolis and the, the site of the murder. And how are you and other Carlton faculty getting ready to talk about that in in classrooms or outside of classrooms this fall? Well, we we barely had a chance to catch our breath um, with everything that's that's happened um, in our area. Um, the murder occurred at the tail end of our spring trimester, and uh, students had to go home that week. And I know that many students wanted to stay and wanted to go up to the cities and join the protests. Um, so there is a sense of a conversation that was never had at the appropriate time. There is a building sense over the summer that uh, our students are going to want to engage in that conversation extensively. Um, and at the same time, we're worried about public health uh, implications and large gatherings on a, on a campus that is relatively small uh, in a rural area with a small community in Northfield of only 20,000 people. So we have to balance the public health concerns with the real um, sort of intellectual and personal uh, concerns of our students who badly want to engage in these sorts of conversations. So over the summer, we have been working, uh, various groups on campus have been working on anti-racism, uh, not only training uh, staff and faculty and preparing for an institution-wide anti-racism program, uh, but one that, that contains pedagogical aspects that we can maybe fit into uh, various courses and departments and make them a, a more permanent aspect of the curriculum at Carleton. So this is a conversation that's here to stay. Um, the, the real question, of course, in my mind is always sustainability. Uh, can we sustain that conversation um, uh, once uh, sort of the memory, unfortunately, the memory of George Floyd's murder will weaken over time, just as the memory of Rodney King's beating uh, weakened over time and didn't lead to, in the long term, the kind of uh, uh, discussion that we're having right now. Um, so the hope is that we can carry it forward. And, uh, you know, others thinking, looking ahead to the uh, election, uh, conversations in the classroom, the, the George Floyd protests, you know, what are ways uh, that we can talk about this uh, fruitfully in our, in, our, in our classrooms with students? Libby, maybe you, one of the I want one of the things that you had shared uh, in your was the the five minute rule um, about having people take on a, a particular perspective. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I also want to you know I am on the board for the Difficult Dialogues National Resource Center, which we founded a number of years ago to keep these things going. And so I, I want to also mention something many of you have heard about called intergroup relations work. Um, mm -hmm. It is it is a again, an ongoing dialogue process that teaches students to keep dialogues going, how to facilitate dialogues, uh, particularly between groups that have been historically at odds with one another, and certainly systemic racism is uh, at the heart of a lot of that work. So if you're not familiar with that model, they can be supportive of you. The five minute rule is very much along the lines of what Al was talking about earlier. A lot of the strategies that come from the work that I do with faculty have to do with recognizing that faculty's time is very pressured and that many faculty won't engage in a lot of difficult dialogues if they think it's going to sort of take over their class or derail the syllabus that they had you know, planned for the 16 weeks that they have students and so forth. And so the five minute rule is a very condensed strategy um, that essentially creates a debate in a classroom without having to have a vast amount of time involved. And it, it works like this, where you're in any group of people, you can teach your students that they can do this with you, or you can reserve the right to yourself. If there is, it's essentially what you're doing, Al. Um, if there is a viewpoint that is being dismissed or is ignored or doesn't show up at all, um, somebody is able to call for, anybody is able to call for the five minute rule. And for five minutes, everyone in the class um, engages with that position from a standpoint of being affirmative of it, whether they agree with it or not. And so, you know, if the if the position is something to do with Confederate monuments, you know, and that they should all be torn down for five minutes, you might entertain the viewpoint that they should remain in place because they remind us of our history and so forth and so on. And so there's a series of questions that students are invited to engage with or faculty, as it happens in my case, um, 
And for five minutes, people speak supportively about that viewpoint. If they cannot speak supportively, they are invited to witness. And I always make the joke that after five minutes, you're invited to return to your previous biases, so don't worry. Um, but, uh, but it has the effect of really surfacing these positions and viewpoints um, that exist in our world, whether they exist in our classroom or not, um, and letting people really begin to wrestle with the legitimacy of viewpoints that they have never even considered because they're so certain all of us, of our own uh, truth, right? And so in a very short period of time, you can bust open the conversation. As uh, Al mentioned, you don't have to identify it's your viewpoint, but if it happened to be your viewpoint and you were in the minority uh, viewpoint in that classroom, suddenly it's gotten some airtime. So it's, it's a really, really helpful kind of yeah. uh, way of engaging. Well, thank you. I think now we're gonna to turn to uh, questions from our audience. I'm gonna start with a question from, uh, from Maggie King here. Um, uh, and this one is is to you, Libby, first. But we'll bring in others. I know uh, Al, too, is at a, a more rural campus. How do we ensure that rural students and students without consistent access to the internet are not left behind during a period of online education? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, as you may know, in Alaska, almost everybody's a rural student, except for, you know, we have one urban center, really, of any note. Um, so we've been putting a lot of attention on this. Um, there's no quick answer because economic inequities are pretty profound. Um, but we did get some CARES money. We've been funneling all the money we've gotten from the feds into um, helping students in those kind of situations. And um, trying to figure out assignments that we can give to people that don't require a lot of bandwidth or that they that they can access, of course, at any point doing asynchronous uh, you know, online um, assignments and so forth. Um, but it is an ongoing challenge that we haven't completely solved. Um, and I guess I'm not being particularly helpful with that, except that I, I'm with you in that we're in that struggle as we speak at our campus and uh, an inordinate amount of resources being given to trying to help those students. Yeah. Well, if, uh, if and, I can jump in, one, sure. one other response to that, and this is an ongoing question also with our hybrid model in the fall, is that we had students on campus in the spring. We, we, there were some students that petitioned to stay. So putting aside yes, international yeah. students that could not go home because home was not safe for them. Uh, and, and, and they were not going to be productive students at home. So we've identified um, the vast majority of those students for the fall. And those students will be in the group of students that we will have on campus. We can, we can have up to 85% of our normal student body on campus in the fall. Yeah. I think we're so going we to have to be extraordinarily flexible. Go Sorry. ahead, Charlie. I just think we're going to have to be extraordinarily flexible. I think uh, we can, that, that all kinds of students, whether it's um, rural students or students who are, um, uh, you know, look, coming from low income situations or students who just don't have a quiet place at home to work uh, because uh, perhaps there's just, a complicated family situation. Um, I think we're going to have to telegraph to students early on that we uh, want to work with them. And if they find themselves in those difficult circumstances that we're gonna find accommodations. Um, and and so I, I'm, I, I, I love all of these ideas. I think they're really important. Um, I think that the, the problems and the challenges that students are gonna be bringing um, are, are probably as particular as, as they are. And it's every teacher, every instructor is going to have to decide how flexible they're willing to be. Um, I think we're probably going to have to be extraordinarily flexible. Yeah, I think, Can yeah. I just jump yeah. in and say, that my, my yes. campus, we did establish, and, and many campuses are, I think, uh, some kind of a institutional position that is dedicated to student success, specifically recognizing the inequities in our student bodies, right, and that certain groups of people certain groups of students tend to do better than others because they have the cultural capital that um, coming in. And so we did also reach out literally with surveys, with texts, with all kinds of mechanisms to every single student um, to get information about their circumstances. We had a survey that asked, do you have access to the internet? What is your computer situation? Do you have a laptop? Can you make it to our library if necessary? And so actually making that kind of um, contact and with the with the parallel with difficult dialogues you know one of the things I suggest if you're going to be engaging in difficult dialogues and you probably are whether you plan to or not right um, <laughs> is to have some kind of 
um, formative, feed, formative feedback cycle going on at all times, right? Where students can give you feedback, whether it's anonymous or whether it's not anonymous on how they're doing, how they're doing with the dialogue. You know, you could have st structured questions that you have them fill out. So you keep your hand on the pulse of what's going on for them, particularly now that it's remote and particularly if you're in a difficult dialogue, but particularly with these issues, like finding out before things get going, as you mentioned, Charlie, you know, um, do you have difficulties accessing the internet before we even start this class so I know who I need to reach for? Yeah, I mean, I think that those are the kind of things that let faculty not just feel like they're ready uh, for when difficult dialogues come up, but they, they can actually proactively introduce topics that are very important for, for the country, for their for their subject area, and feel like um, they're, they're reaching out to their students to have those really important conversations. Uh, our next question is uh, from uh, Florida Atlantic, uh, Provost Britt Dilovich. Uh, some faculty steer class conversations to certain ideological outcomes to an extreme. As faculty are encouraged to have difficult dialogues, how can we spot or correct in remote teaching? That's a tough one. Uh, Al, you're the, you're the dean. I'm going to direct that one to you. <laughs> well, I, part of my job, a little part of my job is I, I am the person in the dean's office that receives student complaints about faculty. And there are a few, you know, over the year, uh, over the course of any academic year, there are a few. And sometimes it's of this nature. Uh, the, the, the student and the professor disagree and the student believes that the professor is imposing uh, their worldview in the class. Um, that usually leads to a conversation between me and the students to get a better sense of what's going on. Sometimes it's the student's view that, 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 that also needs a little bit of massaging and debate. Um, but um, it, it sometimes will lead to a conversation between me and the chair. Um, and how can, at a departmental level, respecting academic freedom of the, of the faculty, there might be a broader discussion among colleagues about the importance of tolerance and diversification of worldviews in the class. So it's a very indirect and respectful approach. Yeah. And, and I really also, encourage, oh, I'm sorry. No, please, Libby, please. Okay, I see that. Um, I really encourage um, faculty to have these conversations amongst themselves. I mean, again, that's the my, that's my constituency, right? Is working with faculty, and there are definitely faculty who have the opinion that you should keep your your own viewpoint out of the classroom entirely and foster, you know, the independent thinking of your students, which is a totally legitimate view. Um, in in the book that I mentioned, there is our faculty who argue the opposite that they should actually put their viewpoint out very strongly, and if they do that, though, they are required required then to bolster massively the confidence of their students to challenge them, right? To make it really, really clear your grade has nothing to do with whether you disagree with me or not. It's going to be based on the following rubric. So it's really clear what that basis is. So there won't be a grade dispute, right? You know, they have to work extra hard uh, to ensure that the students who already sometimes are struggling with their voice, right? Don't feel silenced. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's wonderful. I think most faculty do that most of the time. At UNC Chapel Hill uh, researchers released a, a study early this spring that showed that uh, even a majority of liberals, Democrats, and moderates said that their faculty members welcomed a range of viewpoints, even even when students had a, a sense of the what the faculty member's viewpoint was. But it's it's something that can be uh, not every once in a while not uniformly the case. Charlie, you want to jump in here? Uh, I, I think Samantha wanted to jump in first, if that's okay, Jackie, and I can, oh, sure. I can follow her. Sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah I guess I, I fall in the former camp, I guess, of keeping viewpoint out of the classroom as far as the instructor is concerned, although I do, you know, like to play devil's advocate occasionally. Um, but I think this is a really good opportunity to kind of push for more student-driven um, uh, courses, um, being online. I mean, I loved having group discussions with my students where I was absent. So I really got to hear how they 
um, kind of were grappling with ideas and also got to watch them do that without having to worry about an instructor um, being in the room. And they did it really well. There was never any controversy um, that was observable, at least in the uh, video. So I think like trying to get faculty to embrace the idea that this is a great opportunity for more um, student led courses and dialogues while also keeping their present their presence very visible, um, you know, making sure students know that they are around if they need them, that they are, you know, they're online, they're engaging, you just may not always see them all the time. So maybe even posting videos occasionally was something I did to give like feedback via video instead of just typing. So they knew I was there for them, but that mm -hmm. they in a lot of ways were in control of the class. Yeah, I want to come back to how this is a moment of opportunity too, but Charlie first, please join, chime in. Yeah, very quickly, but I, I think that um, this issue of, of um, how to uh, in, involve, get involved if, if somebody is kind of, if a class is going off the rails or if a faculty member is doing something that uh, we'd like to give feedback on. I think this, what, another topic that this opens up is this, is a, the question of classroom observation during, um, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, um, because uh, at Mercer and many other places, uh, classroom observations are a very important part of, of the system, both of faculty development, but also of just programmatic consistency and community. You know, it's not all um, retributive, it's uh, developmental too. How do we support each other, um, what can we learn from each other as teachers? And that's going to be much more difficult um, while we're doing social distancing um, for face-to-face. -face. And I think we have to be creative about how we're going to do it online. Um, and so uh, I, I, I'm thinking about that right now as a part of the programs that I'm a part of. Um, does this mean that we sign into each other's courses, the online courses, that we become parts of the conversation? Can we, on discussion boards, et cetera, can we do that without shifting the dynamic in, in difficult ways? Um, this is a set of questions that I haven't, I don't have a clear sense of, but I have a, I, I do have a clear sense that, that it's important for us to face um, right away. You know, how can we be engaged with each other? How can our, our hybrid courses and our online courses not be isolating? Um, for lots of reasons. Quality control is just one actually small one. Um, but, but that's a danger that I think we have to face is, is how not to be isolated, how con to continue to be a community of learning, um, even if we're hybridized or online. Yeah, because there's a there's a, a campus wide community, a student community, and a and a faculty community too. And that faculty community is so important to supporting uh, those those other communities. I want to come back to something Samantha said about you know opportunities. You know, we're we've all had this uh, this learning occasion forced on us about online instruction and and different ways of teaching and. I've heard from some faculty about how it's creating new opportunities for them or things that they're gonna they keep doing in the future. Uh, one, one opportunity, a, a faculty member who's, whose campus is two hours from a major airport um, told me about how wonderful it was that when normally it was so hard to get somebody to come as a guest, uh, to bring a different viewpoint to the classroom or be a guest expert or public mm -hmm. figure, um, getting somebody to zoom in for, for 45 minutes or an hour uh, mm -hmm. was creating new opportunities uh, for you know, all kinds of conversations across difference. But what, what are the opportunities for, from this moment? And you know, what, are the, what are the things that we're learning about teaching and about student learning um, that we're going to take uh, you know, whenever it is uh, that we return to uh, some some kind of new normal? Just very quickly, I, I think, and, and not, it's not too obvious to point, I think we're a lot more aware of the material differences among our students. There are some students that feel a sense of alienation because they are not part of the majority culture in a predominantly white institution. And this shift to online and hybrid has really accentuated that even more. So we're, we're more aware of that. We're more aware of class differences for generation students. Now, how we use that awareness going forward uh, to make our pedagogies more sensitive to those, to those differences, to create more equitable ways of accessing our course content I, I think that is a very positive development uh, coming out of all of this. 
Yeah, I would agree. I, I think flexibility in assignments and, and so forth has been part of creating inclusive learning environments for a long time, letting people demonstrate mastery in a whole range of ways, giving them um, opportunities to work in their community and then come back and report in the classroom, tying in what they already know to what we're already doing. We have more opportunities to do that, as you as you just mentioned. Maybe another one is that, you know, we have, uh, I think, generally agreed that um, sort of a flipped classroom has some real advantages where people look at, you know, a lecture for a little while, but then when they're actually with the faculty member with all that expertise, they spend the time in actively applying uh, what they learned in the lecture or the outside readings to real life problems. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. as we go forward, we have a lot of problems. <laughs> I mean, I think we're starting to really realize that the nation's uh, not at its best, you know, peak uh, state um, right now. So you turn around and you find a problem, a pretty gnarly problem. And we really need to be training students to take our expertise that we bring at a higher ed context and apply it to some very wicked problems. And so if we use that opportunity to you know, give the information online, um, you know, in an asynchronous kind of way, and then spend our time with them, really coaching them and helping them and mentoring them and having them lead, as uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we might be training a more robust set of leaders. I don't. Yeah, and I, I think that goes back to one of the comments uh, Charlie made earlier about, about syllabus design. You know, normally. Uh, when one is teaching over say 14 weeks and the class meets every Tuesday and Thursday, you just have a list almost um, of the 28 readings that you're gonna do. And now um, uh, we're, we have the opportunity to be really intentional about thinking about what goes in the, in the synchronous face-to-face -face and what has to be face-to-face -face as much as we can and what is fruitfully discussed in a, in a asynchronous uh, discussion format and I know uh, both Charlie and, and Samantha, you've really thought about that. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that that element of the syllabus design that faculty are really engaged with that, you know, as we're about uh, five weeks or six weeks out from the start of the semester. Charlie, uh, what do you think about with your syllabus? Okay. Well, one thing we, I mean, this, just this hour that we've had together, we've had dozens of good ideas about what could go into syllabus. I do think being explicit in the syllabus is more important now than ever and incentivizing um, students. You know, we sometimes are frustrated that our students are, are grade driven, but we know they are. And once you know that, you can work with that knowledge. And so if you incentivize the, the kind of activities in your course that you think are going to be important to their learning, um, you're, you're, running with the river instead of instead of against it. So building into the syllabus incentives for the kinds of activities that you think are the most important um, and doing that perhaps more explicitly than if you were teaching face to face, I think is important. The, the one other thing I would add is is I really think that faculty members, teachers and, and need to be very in touch with the power they have to um, put together a, either a completely unsustainable plan for their class in their syllabus or to be kind to themselves and their students. We're going into a semester where all of us are probably more stressed than usual, where our students are likely to be more stressed than usual, and where we're being asked to do a lot of things that we haven't done before. If, if we just tack on the new things to these syllabi, but retain all of the things that we've, all, we've already done, we're, we're, it's not going to work out well. Thing, bad things will happen. We're going to crash and burn. Uh, and so uh, we need to build syllabi that acknowledge that. If you're adding new things, those things need to be offset. Um, and if you're going to err in the direction, I would say err in the direction of, of caution and conservatism rather than ambition in, in your syllabus this semester. Well, I think uh, yeah, in, I would, ending on a, on, a, on a call for kindness is a, is a perfect note on which uh, for us to end. So I do want to, th to thank you for uh, uh, Libby, Samantha, Charlie, and Al so much for sharing your expertise with us today and our, our audience for joining us today and your uh, questions and comments. And our sincere best wishes from the Bipartisan Policy Center for everyone who's on a, a college or university campus. Uh, getting ready for what is, is sure to be uh, a most challenging fall semester. So our, our very best. I'd like to ask you to please join us next Friday at noon Eastern for the second in this webinar series, Beyond the Classroom, 
campus life during COVID-19. When we'll be talking about student life, registered student organizations, and getting students ready to discuss issues of national importance as we, we get ready for the election. And we'd like you to ask you please to subscribe to our BPC YouTube channel and to get to know more about our work with the Campus Free Expression Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center by looking at our website, bipartisanpolicy.org, and uh, subscribing to our newsletter. So I want to say thanks very much to all and good day and good weekend. Bye-bye now.